Significant events are taking place around the Arab world these days, some violent and some peaceful, some within one country and some across several different countries. Diplomacy efforts are not proving very successful in Syria, but on the bright side, Tunisia becomes a role model for the rest of the Arab Spring states. Let's read more. In Tunisia, Rami Khouri writes in the Daily Star, calling on Tunisia, the article titles, Let's salute Tunisia and emulate it. Khouri says history will look back on these days and uh, record a variety of noteworthy episodes, whether concerning the war and negotiations between Syrian Salafist Takfiri networks across the Levant, Palestinian-Israeli negotiations, continued military dominance in Egypt, and slow transitions in Libya and Yemen. However, the most important part and truly historic recent event must be the passage of the new constitution two weeks ago by Tunisia's National Constituent Assembly. The writer says this marked a moment of profound significance for the entire Arab world because it was the first time in modern or ancient history that ordinary citizens of an Arab society agreed on the substance of their constitution through a consultative process that achieved a credible national consensus after significant debate and compromise. Tunisia was the first Arab country ever to draft its own constitution, the Kanuna Dawla, Tunisia, or the law of the Tunisian state, which came into force in 1861, and fittingly, it is now the first Arab country to draw up a meaningful and legitimate constitution after a popular revolution that removed a long-serving autocratic government. Khouri adds, if the Arab world had just one country with a credible homegrown pluralistic democracy, then other Arab societies would seek to emulate this historic leap forward. Well, thanks to Tunisia and its heroic people, we now have that one Arab constitutional democracy that is being born. Precisely because the assembly members and many interested Tunisians debated every draft word by word, the final approved version of the constitution enjoys popular legitimacy, which is unprecedented in the Arab world. Beyond this, the document is historic also because it encapsulates a national consensus on the most important and contentious issues that define the identity and the spirit of Arab societies, Arabism, Islam and gender. In a very defensive tone, Khouri adds, no other constitution in Western democracies, even pioneers such as those in the United States, France and Switzerland, was as ambitious as this Tunisian constitution in insisting from the start on equal rights and common values and identities for all citizens, rather than waiting a century or more to give women and minorities equal voting and other civil rights. The Tunisian constitution calls for parity for women in elected public bodies, for example, while also affirming universal freedoms and rights for all citizens, which no Western democracy did at a similar stage. Some blurred areas allow articles of the constitution to respond to issues of profound concern to different groups of Tunisians. So the document notes that uh, Tunisia is a free, independent and sovereign state, Islam is her religion, Arabic her language and a republic her regime. But it also underlines that Tunisia is a state of civil character based on citizenship, the will of the people and the primacy of law. Khouri adds in the Arab world we should salute and thank Tunis, uh, Tunis and its citizens for their great achievements. We must follow in their path and muster the common sense and courage to follow them into the alluring yet for most Arabs elusive world of sensible statehood anchored in the rule of law, citizenship, good governance and the glue of credible constitutionalism that binds them together. An article features uh, in the Washington Post, it comes as the French President François Hollande visits the US and assesses Obama's diplomacy efforts in Syria. The article titled Diplomacy is Failing in Syria, Obama acknowledges, uh, acknowledges this fact and it starts by his administration's acknowledgement Tuesday that diplomacy, the main pillar of its Syria policy, is failing even as uh, civil war in Syria is destroying the country, leaving open the question of what the United States will or can do to stop the slaughter. President Obama said negotiations between the Syrian government and parts of the opposition are far from achieving a peaceful end to the conflict. And in Geneva, the United Nations envoy leading the talks said that they aren't getting anywhere. With each passing day, more people inside of Syria are suffering, President Obama said. The state of Syria itself is crumbling. That is bad for Syria. It is bad for the region. These very words are the same words used by President Assad three years back when the conflict started. President Obama added it is bad for global national security because what we know is there are extremists who have moved into the vacuum in certain portions of Syria in a way that could threaten us over the long term. 
Obama ruled out direct U.S. military intervention, at least for now, but offered no new substitute to address a crisis he called heartbreaking and risky for the entire Middle East, again similar to the words of President Assad. Obama added during a news conference with fr visiting French President François Hollande, nobody's going to deny that there's enormous frustration here. Right now, we don't think that this is a military solution per se to the problem, but the situation is fluid and we are continuing to explore every possible avenue. Director of National Intelligence James R. Clapper Jr. in testimony before Congress on Tuesday called the war which has killed more than 110,000 and displaced millions an apocalyptic disaster. In the absence of any appetite for deposing President Bashar al-Assad by force, diplomacy is the only strategy Obama has advanced to end the fighting. However, negotiations are talking, talking past one another and cannot even agree on what the main goal of the talks should be. Lakhdar Ibrahimi, the UN envoy for Syria, said in Geneva, where talks resumed Monday, the beginning of this week is as laborious as it was the first week. We are not making much progress. On the other hand, the Assad government says the focus of the talks is misplaced and ignores the rising terrorist threat among the opposition forces. The United States and the Syrian opposition delegates object to what they see as the stonewalling at the talks, although they acknowledge a growing infiltration of level ranks by groups with links to Al-Qaeda. And for more updates, visit us on levant.tv. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.